Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching. Back again, today's video is on Exodus 21, 20 through 21. Now you might ask, why do a video on this particular topic regarding the punishment that a master faces in the event of murdering his slave? Well, it's because Muslims bring up this passage a lot as a method of criticizing the Torah. Muslims don't know how to defend their own beliefs, and so when you start criticizing Muhammad, for owning slaves, and when you start criticizing the legacy of slavery uh, and under Islamic ideology in general, they can't defend it. They haven't defended their religion in centuries, and so they just attack Christianity instead. So, if, for example, if you bring up to a Muslim, hey, uh, you know, Sahih al-Bukhari 7263, uh, Umar narrated, I went to the house of the Prophet, and behold, Allah's Messenger was staying in the attic room, and a black slave of Allah's Messenger was at the top of the stairs. A black slave, black slave, black slave, black slave. Bukhari wants to be very sure you know that Muhammad's slaves were black. Or if you read Sahih Muslim, 4113, or perhaps 123 or 1602, if you're looking it up on Sunnah.com, it was narrated that Jabir said a slave came and swore allegiance to the Prophet, pledging to immigrate. He did not realize that he was a slave. Then his master came looking for him. The prophet said, sell him to me. And he bought him for two black slaves. So if you're a Muslim and you have a couple of black slaves, you want to get rid of them or whatever, this is where you can go to find what the Sunnah is on how much these black slaves are worth. Now, the numbers for Sahih Muslim are all over the place. So if you're having trouble finding this, look for the heading. The heading for this hadith is the permissibility of selling animals for animals of the same kind and of different quality. So if you want to know how much your black slaves are worth, again, just look for the heading, the permissibility of selling animals. And that's where you'll find your black slaves, okay? Right under the animals heading. Of course, Muhammad didn't only buy, sell, trade, and own slaves, black slaves at that, but he had other uses for them, soon in Anasai. Hadith 3411, it was narrated from honest that the Messenger of Allah had a female slave with whom he had intercourse. Muhammad had a female slave with whom he had intercourse. This is rated Sahih, by the way, not that that matters because Muslims will throw out any Hadith that they don't like. It doesn't matter if it's Sahih or whatever. If you don't like it, you throw it out. That's the inconsistency uh, that, that Muslims have resorted to in light of all these controversial, uh, to put it nicely, hadith that have uh, risen to the surface since they began to be translated into English. And so you have the Sahih hadith here where Muhammad has sex with one of his female slaves. And of course, this is actually permitted in the Quran, Surah 3350, a prophet indeed, we have made lawful to you your wives to whom you have given their due compensation and those your right hand possesses. Okay, that's the Quran's way of saying your female slaves. So Muhammad can have intercourse with them, and of course this is what is narrated in Sunan Anasai 3411. Now in this case it makes Muhammad's wives a little bit angry. If you go to Kathir's Tafsir on 3350, he talks about some of Muhammad's wives, then he talks about some of Muhammad's female slaves who he freed and then married, and then it talks about some of Muhammad's slaves who he did not free, he just had intercourse with them because they are his property, as Al-Tabri narrates. This is also attested to in Sirat Razul Allah as well. So when you bring this up, or when you bring up perhaps Surat al-Baqarah, Ayah 178, where Allah says, Oh, you have believed, prescribed for you as legal retribution for those murdered, the free for the free, the slave for the slave, the female for the female. So here you have these class distinctions with respect to retribution for murder. Slave for slave, female for female, and free for free. Oh, but wait, Allah thought of a better idea, according to Ibn Abbas, as well as Kathir. Surah 2, 178 is abrogated by Surah 545. So Allah had this great idea for eternity, and he etched it in those eternal tablets, but then he thought of a better idea later on. Surah 545 was revealed, and, uh, you know, again, came up with a better idea. So when you bring up this, you know, this type of thing to Muslims, Muhammad doing all this horrible stuff, Allah allows men to sleep with their female slaves and so forth, a class distinction with respect to uh, retribution for murder. They don't know how to defend their beliefs, so they just attack Christianity. So they bring up Exodus 21, 20 through 21, which reads, Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two since the slave is their property. So I'd like to present what Nahum Sarna says with respect to this verse, or these two verses. And uh, it's not only Sarna who says this, but I really like the JPS Torah series. I've used it before here on this channel, and uh, they do really, really good work. 
Um, so I'm going to refer here to what Sarna says on Exodus 21, 20 through 21. And Sarna loves his Hebrew, as anybody should who actually really wants to study the Old Testament, which is no Muslim ever, by the way. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background here in the Hebrew, just very quick, because I've been accused of going too far in depth. So um, just two quick things. Okay, when you read the translation... And here's where part of the difficulty with this verse emerges. When you read the preceding verses, it's listing cases that require capital punishment, okay? And the phrase is, shall be put to death, okay? If a man strikes another man, he dies, he shall be put to death. He shall be put to death over and over. And then you get to this passage about slaves, and it says, he shall be punished or avenged. So the translation changes, and it makes the penalty sound different for a slave man versus a free man. Now, this is very interesting because the Hebrew changes. Okay, so the translations are accurate. The Hebrew changes, and therefore the translations change. Okay, so if you were to read that last phrase, Exodus 21, 12, the Hebrew there is moth yamath. Okay, moth yamath. But then when you get to the last phrase, and, and that's shall be put to death. When you get to the last phrase in Exodus 21, 20, that he must be avenged in Hebrew, that is... And the uh, vowel pointing is a little bit smeared here, but it's uh, nakom yenakem, okay? Nakom yenakem. So you can hear the different, the different sounds there in Hebrew. And the verb here, the stem, the lexical form, I should say, is nakam, all right? Which means to avenge. So it's, it's translated accurately um, here in the new JPS translation, which is what Sarn is going off of. Okay, so why does this change? Why do the translations change? Why does the Hebrew change? change. Now, if you're a Muslim watching this, you're going to want to stop the video right now because this is going to destroy your argument, and we know that Muslims can't have that. They have to keep treating the text dishonestly. So, But I know the Christians will continue watching past this point. All right, so contrary to what Muslims say about this particular section of the Torah, Sarna says this law, the protection of slaves from maltreatment by their masters, is found nowhere else in the entire existing corpus of ancient Near Eastern legislation. Okay, so why is this so much different from other ancient Near Eastern legal codes? Well, there are examples. I'll just give a quick one. Uh, Hammurabi, okay? If a man kills a free man's son, then the penalty is different from if a man kills, say, the son of a slave or a slave, okay? The penalty is different, you know, slave versus free, the kind of thing that we see in the Quran that before Allah came up with a better idea. Sarna says that this passage isn't like that. He says this is different. On the phrase, he must be avenged, which is uh, going back to that last phrase in Exodus 21, 20, he says the master is criminally liable and faces execution in keeping with the law of verse 12. He must be put to death. This interpretation that the Hebrew stem, nakam, or NKM, he's using a different transliteration than what I've learned. It would be NQM, uh, but he's, he's using NKM for his transliteration system, means the death penalty is supported by the early tradition behind the Samaritan version, which in place of the received Hebrew text actually reads here, he must be put to death. All right, that moth yamad, or it would be actually moth yamad, moth yamad, um, which is the phrase shall be put to death. He says that, Ibn Ezra notes that the verb NKM, as used in the Bible, principally involves meeting out the death penalty. In the absence of the office of public executioner, it would generally be the victim's next of kin who would administer the supreme penalty as provided for in Numbers 35.19 and Deuteronomy 19.12. This would hardly be the situation in the case of a slave who would be unlikely to have local relatives. Hence, the obligation to exact the penalty falls on the community which is probably why NKM is used here, and not the usual yamat. So, why is it that the verb in Hebrew changes? Well, according to Sarna, the slave is assumed not to have anyone to exact uh, legal justice for his death. The slave won't have any family to avenge his death, and so the responsibility falls on the community, and that's why Sarna says that the verb actually changes. He supports this with Ibn Ezra's citation about how the verb nakam is used elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, and he also supports it, supports it with the Samaritan version as well, which actually reads moth yamad, just like the preceding verses. So, 
The, the first issue then with this, these two verses is the must be avenged. And I think Sarna, as well as other sources I have, but I just like the, I like the JPS Torah series. Sarna gives a very good reason about why that change occurs. Now the second issue, but if he survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged since he is the other's property. Okay, so this makes it sound like you can beat a slave within an inch of his life, and if it doesn't die, you're, you're fine. The issue here, and I've covered some of this in my um, series on Deuteronomy. This is a primitive, ancient code before science, before forensics. They couldn't perform autopsies, etc. And the penalty here is ultimate. It's the death penalty. And so the law wants to make sure that the slave died as a result of what the master did. And if there's any doubt there, then the master is not executed. All right, so so you're you're juggling two extremes for sure. I mean, you don't want to allow um, a master who killed his slave to walk free, but at the same time, you don't want to execute a man for something that you can't prove that he did. And so there are several cases in these ancient Near Eastern legal codes where the law seems harsh to us, but we have to remember when it comes to the death penalty. And we have to take into account the fact that they didn't have any of these modern forensic methods. They have to make sure that the person is actually deserving of the death penalty. Okay. Now, with respect to mistreating your slaves, um, Exodus 21 continues. And uh, it says in verse 26, Exodus 21, 26, When a man strikes the eye of a slave, male or female, and destroys it, he shall let him go free on account of his eye. If he knocks out the tooth of a slave, male or female, he shall let him go free on account of the tooth. So, the, you know, again, the Torah here is not a complete set of legal codes. When you contrast the civil criminal codes with the religious, the difference is just readily apparent. The religious codes, what the priests are supposed to wear, how the implements are supposed to be fashioned, um, how sacrifices are to occur, the construction of the tent of meeting, tabernacle, ark. This is extremely detailed. Okay, The law is not like that. So what's so significant about an eye or a tooth? Nothing. It's just conveying a general point. And the rabbis pick up on this. They say, eye or tooth or any other of the chief external organs of the body. Rabbinic law lists 24 such, including the fingers, toes, tip the, tips of the ears, and tips of the nose. Should the master injure any of these, the slave is given his freedom. So it's nothing special about an eye or a tooth. The law is just conveying the general point, okay, don't abuse your slaves. And the rabbis come along, and they, when they actually codify it, they're much more exhaustive. And those of us who study the Torah a lot, uh, the Torah a lot, are perhaps thankful that the law was not written to this level of detail on every particular verse because it would be quite tedious. So the rabbis here pick up on what's going on. They codify what I say, 24 um, of these extremities, um, and the slave is given his freedom if he's abused. Oh, and by the way, um, if a man struck his slave and the slave dies, the death can be tied back to the master. The rabbi tradition, uh, the rabbinic tradition here, according to Sarna, prescribed decapitation. So it's something that the rabbis took quite seriously. So you can see now why Sarna says that the code here in Exodus 21, 20 through 21 is quite different um, particularly with respect to the later verses about even protecting a slave from being abused, even if that abuse didn't involve death. Now, beyond that, the Israelites were charged with something far more serious, and that's by God directly. And this occurs over and over again. I cover this in my video on Deuteronomy uh, with respect to foreigners. I'll just read uh, one verse or a couple of verses here. The Lord defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Now, time and time again, this occurs. I just cited one particular example here, but God uses this as an example. He uses their history to teach them a lesson. You know, you don't get to build up all of this animosity for being slaves for so many years in Egypt, 
and then get to take it out on the slaves among you, the sojourners and the foreigners among you, once you become an established nation. No, God uses that as a reminder. Did you like the way you were treated in Egypt? No? Okay, treat the sojourners among you the way you want to be treated. God says, I love them, so you love them too. A very serious command from God there to the Israelites. All of these things have to be considered if you want to talk about slavery and how it was uh, practiced and the laws regarding it throughout the Torah. And then we fast forward to, what, a millennium and a half later, and there's Muhammad selling his black slaves like animals and having sex with his female slaves and producing revelations from Allah saying this is all okay. And this is why polemics from Muslims against Christianity always turn around to bite them, because the Torah proves time and time and time again to be well ahead of the regressive Islamic law that began to take root in Arabia in the 7th century. So that's all for this video on Exodus 21, 20 through 21. Hope you enjoyed, and thanks so much, as always, for watching. I'll see you next time.